What we're finding now, and a lot of researchers are coming out to show, is that strong evidence from all across the world, from ice core samples to these ancient texts, all the way to looking at these megalithic structures and the geology that we've seen that has changed over time, uh, the evidence really shows that we've had these disastrous cataclysms that occurred around the, edge, the end of the last ice age, um, around 12,000 years ago. And when that occurred, it destroyed an entire civilization that used to exist. And a lot of people have called that the great lost civilization of our planet. So those civilizations that, that were here once, they left behind a, a numerous um, ancient teachings and, and the wisdom that they had developed over thousands and thousands of years. And when they were destroyed, all that we have left are those writings and those ancient stories about you know, what happened long ago, what their civilization was like, and, and who influenced their civilization. And so when I was going through doing research and, and putting this book together, it became apparent to me that I really needed to include as many ancient uh, texts as possible because in many ways, these ancient texts are being uh, largely suppressed. And in other ways, they're also being destroyed and, and kept from society because what they do is they tell a far different story than we've been told in school, which basically completely alters our perspective for both how, how far back human civilizations go and how sophisticated they were. And in many ways, the secrets that they knew about the Earth and the universe and the nature of reality is far superior than we have now. And so we, had, in many ways, after the, dis the disasters occurred, and I can go into that in great detail after, we had to start over as a civilization, and that's why I, I, I see the, the significance of these ancient writings. And so I've included what I believe to be more ancient writings and um, texts than any, any book written, because to me that's what matters the most, is preserving this ancient wisdom so it can exist long into the future. I really feel that the evidence is strong to show that these ancient civilizations were imparted this knowledge, okay? Because the, the reason we say, I say that is not that I'm trying to downgrade human achievements. Humans have achieved great things here. And of course, it, there's a little blip possibly in the history book, books talking about how the Sumerians were the first civilization on Earth who developed agriculture and mathematics and a, a knowledge of astronomy. And, but where did they get that from? Well, they clearly state in their writings that they were handed down this wisdom from above, from, from what they called heaven. And, of course, that term later became referenced and used in, in, in a lot of um, biblical ways. But heaven essentially meant beyond the realm of earth. And these, these civilizations became, you could even call them, obsessed with those entities and those beings that they were in contact with, and they were getting influenced by, and they became the ancient gods of history. And they became the angels and the demons and all the things that we think of in a more biblical reference. But what it comes down to is human beings exist in a third-dimensional physical reality. Science and string theory and looking at metaphysical nature of our reality shows that everything is based on vibrational frequency and that there are at least nine different dimensions. So when we consider that and that us here in this physical dimension is only giving us a small glimpse of what actually represents reality, it wouldn't be that far-fetched to think that there's a lot more that exists beyond what we can perceive, and that those civilizations and cultures could have been influenced long ago from many, many different places, and that, and that we simply have become very close-minded of, of, of accepting the fact that, you know, we live on a, we live on a planet that's surround, surrounded by vast cosmos that has, you know, almost infinite Earth-like worlds and potential for life to exist, and yet we keep a very close-minded viewpoint of anything that could have influenced us in the past. And we always think, oh, these achievements are ours, everything is all about humanity, you know, we've gotten here because of our own, our own right, and we can do whatever we want because of it. But really, it's, I don't see that the way it is at all. And I, I see us more as stewards here, and we should really be changing our perspective. Here we have, we have a vast universe. Even our, even our galaxy alone that we exist in is one of millions to potentially billions of other galaxies that are in the known universe. And within just our galaxy alone, we know that there are potentially millions of Earth-like worlds. If we think of us as 
eternal conscious beings, and that's what defines us. And the body is more like an antenna, in a vessel for us to experience a physical reality. Then altering one's consciousness was the only way for for someone back then or even now to be able to experience these other sides of reality and also to potentially get into contact with any beings or what entities that may exist in these higher and lower dimensions. And I think that's why you see a lot of both strange rituals with some of these um, elites we've seen in the past with the places like the Bohemian Grove and a lot of these strange sacrificial things for for lower vibrational dimensional energies, but really then there's another side of it where there have been other sacred ancient priests and um, and a lot of these wisdom, mystics and wisdom um, bringers who have worshipped um, higher dimensions and have tried to use consciousness to alter, to connect to some of these higher dimensions. So it seems that altering one's consciousness to, re- to, to move outside of the third dimension is, where, is what the, the great focus has been of a lot of these civilizations, and some have used it for good, and some have used it for bad. The, the Book of Enoch is one of these, these pre-Christian ancient Gnostic writings. It's not included in the Bible. But one of the things that's remarkable about it and why it's not included is that it talks about these watchers. These watchers that are here that they consider who observe our reality and observe humanity from, from afar, and that instead of us thinking that we're all alone here, we're actually being observed the entire time. And that the Book of Enoch really goes into explaining how things in the past were a lot different than they are now. Things, even in the past, things like giants used to exist. And, and how human beings are part of a great cycle of consciousness that changes over time. And that we're reaching what is known now, according to the Mayans, as universal consciousness. When we will no longer exist in what, you, what was called the old reality, the old paradigm that used to um, hold us back through the, the means of materialism and, and, and a more of a Darwinian perspective. When you go and look and you actually study these, you find out that there have been very credible people who have translated them. And what I do is I go back to the source of the, of the greatest experts that have translated them. In my opinion, those experts go all the way back to the 18, 1849 to George Smith with the Chaldea of Count of Genesis. And so we're talking well over 100 years ago. And George Smith was an, basically a seriologist expert. And they, he translated these texts long before we had any of the stigma we have now, where people think, oh, Zechariah Sitchin mistranslated everything in these texts, and the Anunnaki aren't real, and none of this is real. Well, just go look at the Chaldea of Count of Genesis. George Smith translates the Atrahasis in that, and he clearly states and backs up that, that, of course, first of all, that the Anunnaki are real, and that they've had a major, played a major role in our past. And that's what the Sumerians called them. They called them the, the Anunnaki, but the, they, they themselves, these ancient beings that we called gods, called themselves the great Anuna. And the Atrahasis goes through an account of talking, what's, what's so important about it is it's basically one of the accounts that discusses pre, pre-cataclysm disaster of the last ice age. So when we think what happened with these ancient civilizations before they were destroyed, well, the Atrahasis is one of the most important of all of them. Because Atrahasis himself was considered the, the last king of the city of Sharupak. And Sharupak was a city in Mesopotamia, who was, which was later destroyed as part of this disaster. And according to another tablet, the Sumerian King List, which is, why, which is how you verify this information, you find out, oh, his name, his name in the Sumerian King List was Zayasudra. And he was, he was known as the son of Ubaru Tutu, who is who is a who is actually a great king of Shurupak, and then the the story just keeps weaving deeper and deeper, and and the, you continue to research this character who wrote these tablets, and you find out that he later became the biblical Noah, that later on survived these disasters, and that's the only reason he was able to write down the events of what happened because he was one of the few elder um, priest great kings who was able to actually survive this event. The Code of Hammurabi is considered the largest cuneiform tablet in the world. And unlike um, clay tablets that are usually much smaller and are, have been written on and then baked, 
the Code of Hammurabi is this enormous stella. And what it, what it represents is in, in Mesopotamia, there was an ancient city called Babylon. And I know a lot of people have heard of Babylon. Oh, yes. Now, Babylon itself is another one of these cities that spans a, a much longer time period than, we, than we've been taught. And the way that works is essentially it's, it's been rebuilt over time after these disasters occurred. And the Code of Hammurabi is discussing how when a lot of these kingships were being established, these, these models for civilization, after these disasters occurred and before, they would, re, they would lower kingship with all these moral laws and codes for what, how civilization should, should go. During about 1712 B.C., Babylon rose to become one of the largest city centers on the, on, in the world. It had over 200,000 people. And one of the interesting things about that is, well, how did Babylon rise to become such a large center of civilization? Is that just a random coincidence? Well, it's actually not. We, we, were, we were discussing the Code of Hammurabi, in a, and according to the Code of Hammurabi, which I was talking about before, it's, it's essentially a seven-and-a-half-foot-tall stella with cuneiform writing all the way down it. And it describes 282 laws to follow for bringing stability and morality to mankind. Now, Hammurabi clearly states that he did not create these laws himself. And that's what is so fascinating about this information. You see this over and over again. You also see it with the legend of Atanya, too, how these kings are essentially given kingship and rulership over a certain region. And then they're given certain moral laws and codes codes for how to rule over civilization. So it's not like these kings just end up there and then they decide on how the kingdom is going to be run. It seems more like they're emissaries and they're, they're chosen to rule. Um, and that's one of the reasons why these, the Anuna are called the ordainers of destinies. That's what, what they actually say about themselves, because they create what the destiny would be. So what, Koda, what Hammurabi says, and it, when he's in this stella, um, he discusses where all this came from, and he shows how he, he shows how this being he calls Bel, B-E-L, um, and he also refers to the the solar deity aspect of it called Shamash. But he says that this this being presented him with all of this information and knowledge, and then told him essentially how to rule. And I'm just going to read a really quick quote of how this large stella code um, starts. It says. When Anu, the sublime king of the Anunnaki, and Bel, the lord of heaven and earth, who decreed the fate of the land assigned to Marduk, the overruling son of Ea, god of righteousness, dominion over earthly man, that made him great among the Njiji. They called Babylon by his illustrious name, made it great on earth, and founded an everlasting kingdom in it, whose foundations are laid so solidly that those of heaven and earth. Anu and Bel called by name me, Hammurabi, the exalted prince who feared God to bring about the rule of righteousness in the land, to destroy the wicked and evil doers, so that the strong should not harm the weak, so that I should rule over the people like Shamash and enlighten the land, to further the well-being of mankind. And then it ends by saying, When Marduk sent me to rule over men, to give the protection of right to the land, so you get this information that talks about how, well, wait a minute, so he is given this rulership from Bell, who you find out is just simply another name for Marduk. And then this, this, this story just keeps weaving deeper and deeper. Well, okay, so the, Bab- the city of Babylon itself is actually a name that, that is translated directly from the name of Marduk. And then you do a little digging into Marduk, and you find out that Marduk was literally the chief god of Babylon. Babylon became corrupted by a, um, a lot of different things. One of those things became becoming a war empire. And there's actually even some areas that talk about how some of the kings of Babylon later were starting to dabble into things like black magic. It, you find out that Babylon, like I was saying, was ruled by this god known as Marduk, whereas just north of Babylon, the city of Nineveh was a city who was ruled over by Enlil, who was known as Ashur. Now, you find out that both of these gods hated each other, and they were in fierce competition. And just like that, you find out that Nineveh in Babylon had been competing for supremacy over the Assyrian Empire for years and years and years. And they were two completely different places. Babylon started as a place of accumulating wealth of knowledge, but later became corrupted by military might and empire building, whereas Nineveh 
was more of a place that was establishing physical beauty. It actually none of it was actually um, the location of the the famous Hanging Gardens because it was connected to the first aqueduct duct ever built on Earth in a in a in the town of Jerwan, Iraq. Now that aqueduct fed this uh, was connected to this incredibly lavish city called Nineveh, who which is the location of where this this king named Ashurbanipal formed this massive library that few have ever even heard of called the Royal Ashurbanipal Library. Now, Ashurbanipal was a high priest, priest who realized the importance of these ancient texts, just like Hammurabi did. And so while Hammurabi and a lot of these other kings are gathering this information as well in these libraries, so was Ashurbanipal. And so the Ashurbanipal Library that he created ended up being probably the most significant library ever created in, 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 the, in human history. It was actually even exceeding um, the Library of Alexandria because it contained ancient writings from far earlier than that ever had, which we know the Library of Alexandria was later burned down by the, by the Romans when they invaded. Eventually, Ashurbanipal died, and so Babylon joined forces with the Chaldean people, and they overthrew and attacked Nineveh, and they burned the entire city to the ground, along with this library known as the Royal Ashurbanipal Library. Well, Hundreds and hundreds of years later, thousands of years later, in 1849, they found those ruins when they were doing an archaeological dig. And thankfully, tablets that people don't know, they're basically clay that has writing etched in it that's then baked. The Ashurbanipal Library was essentially this a mass of thousands of cuneiform tablets that had been, that had been collected. And a lot of those became, were later housed in the British Museum. But the, the thing that's amazing, amazing about it, and is the reason why I, I wrote this book and why I included so many of these translations, is most of those, those ancient cuneiform tablets, and remember, this is the wisdom from these lost civilizations that, that we've been made to believe don't even exist, and yet they provide this knowledge of an entire time period that we think is just a myth. But the thing that's important about that is that those translations and those ancient texts, most of them untranslated. They're, not, they're, they're just sitting there. This time period of the last Ice Age, which was around 12,000 years ago, dramatically ended. And when it ended, it, it, it killed off all kinds of megafauna that used to exist in the nor northern hemisphere. That ice cap is called the Laurentide Ice Sheet, and that covered the entire northern hemisphere of the planet. And that, that was in a time period, when, it, when that melted, that time period was called the Younger Dryas. And when that melted, it destroyed entire lost civilizations that were existed on the earth and now the one of those lost civilizations that is talked talked very extensively about the egyptian from the egyptians which was later translated and given to men like socrates and eventually plato was talking about the the existence of atlantis long ago somewhere southwest of the straits of gibraltar which is in uh, western africa and they and, the, and plato talks about in the timaeus and critias extensively how this civil grand civilization was destroyed uh, 11,600 years ago, or in, or in that time period, from violent cataclysms that wiped them all out. But what you find out is that Egypt at that time period was called Kem. It was before the dynastic pharaohs. We had to really alter our entire perspective of these different time periods of history. When this civ civilization called Atlantis was being destroyed, Though the people there, some of these priests moved to Egypt and they established, they attempted to establish a new civilization there. According to these ancient writings, um, Atlantis was first corrupted morally. They became a civilization that became corrupted by wealth and corrupted by power, just in a very similar way, actually, to how, how our society is going today. As Atlantis was being destroyed, and it wasn't just a one night thing, um, they, they talk about how there was a lot of volcanic activity and rising sea level, and so Atlantis was being slowly destroyed. It wasn't just an overnight thing. And because of that, those people that, those people, some of the people that were there, some of the priests and these wise individuals left Atlantis to found a new civilization. But Atlantis was later destroyed, just as the civilizations that were later created in Egypt were. And that's a very important thing to, to wrap our heads around, because the dynastic pharaohs, who wrote all the hieroglyphs that came later, they had nothing to do with the Great Pyramids or any of those large structures that are there. Those are remnants of these ancient civilizations that were there long ago. Just because 
hieroglyphs exist on something does not mean they created it. A lot of these, a lot of these empires and dynastic pharaohs, when they found these structures, they wanted to take them over as their own so they could rewrite history and become great leaders. And so the evidence that's now coming to light, and I, I, I talked about, again, looking at geologic evidence, and looking at these ancient tablets and seeing everything that goes together. And then the final piece of the puzzle is, when you identify where these megalithic building practices have been done around the world, you go to places like Machu Picchu, you go to places like Pumapunku, and you go, then you go across the world and places around the Mediterranean through Baalbek, Lebanon, and Petra, Jordan, Saudi Arabia, right down into Mesopotamia and Iraq with places like Kinnis Rock. In all of those locations, and of course down into Egypt, in all of those locations, you find this advanced, sophisticated building technique with these megalithic structures. Megalithic means large single stone, okay? And those structures have been carbon dated, especially in locations like Gobekli Tepe in Turkey, to be over 11,600 years old. That proves that they were around as part of these lost civilizations. But the, then the question becomes, well, what destroyed them? And that's where you start looking at what I was mentioning with all that data. When you go and visit these, these buildings, these structures, especially in places like Karnak, Egypt, and around the temple, the enclosure of the Sphinx, you find that when you can establish, okay, I know that this lower section, this precision building right here, this is from the old civilization, and then later on top was then, was then built over by the civilizations that came later. Much less sophistication, much more primitive tools used. But what you find on those structures when you can identify them is is that they've been, in many ways, destroyed, thrown and strewn all over the place, but also they've had something called vitrification occur to them. This scarring you see on them, this breakdown of the rock, this burning that's occurred on, on the surface, some of the quartz that's contained within them into glass. And you also find that desert glass in parts of the Sahara. So what could have created that massive amount of heat to destroy some of these structures? and cause these civilizations to be destroyed. Well, the great theory that is really being proposed that starts to make sense is that it seems that our Earth goes through these cycles of destruction based on these sun changes, these solar changes. And what happens is, over time, the electromagnetic protective grid that exists around our Earth is weakened over these certain periods of time, and it can allow these dangerous solar outbursts to come into the Earth and, and those can have dramatic effects far beyond just the solar implications. Human civilization has yet again, as part of another epic, risen up again to reach a more sophisticated level. And are we, just like our predecessors in the past, are we about to be wiped out and reset as well?